One week of spring practice is in the books, and there have been some major standouts. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He writes for Inside the Huskies of Fan Nation Sports Illustrated. I'm the site editor over the Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen of the day, as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. And Lars, we've got so much to talk about today because week one of spring balls in the books. All our everydayers out there are listening to this on Tuesday as week two is about to get underway. So we're not going to waste any time. We're going to jump right in here. Some of the biggest winners from spring ball. Uh, let's let's start with Denzel Boston. It feels like that's that's the, that's the only place we can start. Yeah, exactly. Because again, it's one of those where we all know coming into the spring, they're replacing all three starters, right? Just off the bat, whether you call Zhao as a starter, or Jeremiah came in as a starter, whatever you want to call it. His progression in these first three practices. Now, again, it's worth kind of caveating. You're probably thinking Denzel's running with the ones and Hunter's running with the twos. That's not going to be permanent, right? Because, again, first week things, whoever the quarterback two is, you need to have some decent receivers to throw to. Again, they do have a questionable offensive line. So maybe, maybe not. But Denzel, hey, we'll with or without, but, but Denzel, with or without any other additions, has just – he picked yeah. up right where he left off from last fall camp. Not not last fall, but last fall camp, right? For most of the people yeah. of the everydayers – weren't able to see what he was doing in practice. I think he's gotten better than he was last fall, but in fall camp. But I mean, man, like he was already doing a lot of that one, that one on one from Will Rogers to against the efficiency price stock. Like yeah. that to me, I was like, okay, okay, there now, yes, like he's coming into his own. That's not just a practice play. That's not just a oh hey, you know, we're just gonna let him go. No, he went bat. He went and battled EP for that ball and ended up getting both feet down. So that was an NFL touchdown, not just a yeah. not just a college touchdown. That's an NFL touchdown against with two NFL guys going at it. So I think that's been kind of the highlight for spring ball is seeing all the other receivers go against EP. It's like I think Denzel is kind of quietly becoming the who would, actually here's a good segue off of this because it still goes into it. Okay, who would you say is the measuring stick at receiver in spring ball right now? Is it Denzel or is it Jeremiah? It's it's still Denzel, and okay, you, you talked to, you talked a little bit about Jeremiah. I I was I was actually gonna I've got something written down that I wanted to get to in our second segment when we talk about some of the, some of the questions that we have because Jeremiah was a late addition to the roster just in terms of you know when he was actually able to enroll, so he hasn't been able to get up to speed and been out there with the first team just yet. So I was gonna talk about that just a little bit of a question I had about that, but I'll just do that now. Where it's what are the two of those guys gonna look like when they're on the field together because we haven't seen that yet. And that's something I'm really excited to watch going forward because we know what kind of player Jeremiah is and what kind of player he's going to be moving forward in this offense with Jed Fish because we saw what Tyro McMillan did at Arizona. We saw what Jacob Cowling, Dorian Singer did down there. And Jeremiah Hunter and Denzel Boston are perfectly capable of filling those kinds of roles and honestly doing a lot more with them, in my opinion, than most of those guys. I think Tyro Rowe is going to be the number one receiver off the board in 2025, so that's a different story. But I think that they're both more than capable of filling those roles and doing a whole lot with it. So what – sorry, sorry. that's really what I was going to say is just – once those two guys get on the field, I feel like it's going to be a different sort of mismatch than it was with like a Rome and a Jalen Polk, where those are two NFL caliber receivers right there. But they both just kind of had their individual skill sets. But when you look at Jeremiah Hunter and Denzel Boston, it feels like they can both do, and I, it's in no way a comparison, but it feels like they can both do just like a little bit more just in terms of Rome is Rome and he was able to do a little bit of everything. But Jalen Polk just kind of had a little bit of a specialty and a few skill sets. Whereas with these two guys, it doesn't feel like there's that, I don't want to call it a limitation, but just like more of a, all right, we know this works where it's okay, we can go to anything and these, these plays are all going to work. Right, and I mean, to your point, we've seen that in spring ball where they basically run the same set of plays with both receivers. And so I think yeah. it's pretty clear that they both know that they can do those things. Again, obviously Denzel is just a little bit shorter, but it doesn't. there's not that much of a gulf between the two, right? Where to your point, it's not like Denzel does two or three things that, that uh, Jeremiah Hunter flat out can't do, right? And, and vice right. versa, right? There are a couple of other receivers, I think, which to your point we'll get to in the second segment about how do you balance out that trio. But yeah, Denzel's been another one. When kind of in a similar mold to that, I think we should always go on the other side of that and just talk about a few price stock, right? Because yeah. I think 
the one thing that I've caught and and we'll, we'll carry this on in the second segment to talk about some questions at receiver is every single receiver has wanted to go against the PCS price stock. And that's no disrespect to Elijah Jackson. That's no disrespect to Jordan Shaw, who, by the way, I want to also give some flowers to in the segment, J- Elijah Jackson as well, kind of just carrying on from what he was able to do last season. But if he's price stock, it's almost like Trent McDuffie, you know, Kyler, all, all those guys reincarnated, right? Where we want the best corner. We want to go against the best corner. I don't know if I'm the best receiver, but there's only one way to find out. And it's going against that guy. And we've seen a number of guys go against him and not necessarily struggle, but, you know, again, I mean, Denzel didn't beat him every single time. So I think this is a different spring to where, you know, I was actually thinking about this. Remember last spring when Rome cooked everybody, including oh, yeah. Jafar? That hasn't happened this spring. Now, again, yeah. Denzel cooked EP on that one play, but it wasn't like, hey, every single time the receivers are cooking. But it's also, to be fair, not like the receiver, not like the DBs were also cooking every single time too. So I think there's been a good kind of balance back and forth. But man, getting a fishing price stock, and I know you kind of took a step back when I said it at practice. I think it's no slight to Takario Davis. I think they got the right one and the better one for the system. Now again, that's a, that has, that takes nothing away from Takario Davis, right? I'm just saying right. like the Takario is Takario for a reason, right? Much like uh, Tetero McMillan is, is 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 him for a reason, right? There's there's a separate yeah. there's a separate little bit there. But if, if they didn't get a price Prysock, then now this cornerback room looks a lot different, whereas that's why sure. they had to go out and get a guy like that who can just straight up block guys. To, and my word, he is every bit of 6'4". Like, I think he might even yeah. be 6'5". Like, Keith Taylor was also 6'4". <laughs> like, Keith, Keith Taylor was also 6'4". But line up Keith Taylor and line no. up Vicious Prysock, they are two different players. It's not Pry- Prysock is certainly bigger. He And just – one of the, one of the things, and I pointed this out in, in like a in a winner's article I had over on Huskies Wire, the same thing, talking about him because I agree where he was one of the, the five winners that I had is his movement for that size too. Where that's something where whenever I'm watching a recruit or a commit, when I'm watching their film, movement for size is a very important part of just that whole process. And I remember you and I were talking about this with uh, a couple other people, with uh, our buddy Nick from over at Last Word on College Sports, a couple other people where we were just saying he shouldn't be able to move that well in his size. We're not saying like, Oh, like, no, that's that. Does, it's just, that literally does not make sense. Like just, he's so big and moves so well, his feet and his hips and everything. They're so fluid. It's just so much fun to watch. And that being said, one more guy that like, I, I know you talked about Jordan Shaw, but one more person that I really do want to give flowers to is somebody that, we haven't necessarily talked about him a whole bunch. It's probably just because he was just one of the few returning veterans where we know what we're going to get from him, but it's Carson Bruner. Carson Bruner has been out there a lot. He's been out there on every single play, basically. It's just kind of what it feels like at this point. And he's just making plays. He's all over the field and he's doing everything that he was at the end of last fall, where then last fall and, and just through the winter, he was awesome. He's making every single tackle. He's flying around the field and now stepping into a starting role. And I'll get to one of the other things that I want to say about Carson in the next segment, but just everything that we've seen from him is just so exciting. And I think he's going to be one of the better linebackers in the big 10 this year. Right. And it's all been kind of a perfect progression for him because he started out as a special teams, ace, backup linebacker, things like that. But the way he was reading and reacting and just obliterating, go, go watch the Michael Penix reaction against Michigan state. That tells you all you need to know about what Carson Brewer can do on special teams. But with that being said, it was just, it was a kind of a natural progression for him, but he was never going to start over Eddie last year. Yeah. Argu- arguably we could, we, we probably could have had the discussion. Should he start over Alfonso? But I think now starting. And he kind of got Alfonso, there towards the end of the year. Exactly. And so I think he's just been similar to Denzel, right? He's been built, he picked up where he left off last season. And now coming into this one with Robert Bala, he's already a full, got a fully rounded out linebacker that can do a number of different things. You don't have to necessarily teach him new things. You just kind of got to fine tune some of the other skills. And then being a captain of the, not, okay, I shouldn't say captain, but being one of the vocal leaders, the vocal listeners of the defense, probably more likely than not a captain when that time comes to fruition down the road. But He's just taken every single natural progression. And again, obviously he has the bloodlines, but to make it year one or year two, year two to year three, and continue to build, continue to grow. This is like the perfect resolution for him because now he gets to be the linebacker in an NFL defense before he goes off to the NFL, which I mean, it's a perfect progression for him. Absolutely. And Lars, that being said, let's get into some questions that we've got. 
right after a message from our good friends over at FanDuel because it's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 win or lose. You can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe, secure, and easy to use. What are you waiting for? Visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. And speaking of number one, Lars, I'm going to keep doing it. I know people don't like when I just push my Boston agendas during these segments over and over and over again, but just make sure you put place any bets on FanDuel on the Celtics to win the NBA Finals. It's the, it, it just, it really does feel like it's going to be their year. That team is so deep and so much fun to watch. So, Let's get into some questions. And I want to keep talking about Carson Bruner here because you and I got to talk to him along with the rest of the media. Not, you know, we're, we're not that special, but along with the rest of the media, we got to talk, to, we got to talk to Carson Bruner after practice on Saturday. And one of the things that you talked about the NFL defense is the inclusion of helmet comms and just being able to call plays, which makes play calling a whole lot easier, probably makes installing Steve Belichick's defense a little bit easier just in terms of verbiage, in terms of things that he wants to do. And then Carson's it's probably going to be the guy wearing the helmet on the field that will actually call plays. And he talked about it being a little bit weird, but I'm really excited to see it in action because I think it's going to take a whole lot of confusion. And he talked about, you know, getting used to it and, you know, certain down and distance, what he's probably going to hear and getting used to just kind of listening for certain things. So I'm just, I'm really intrigued to see where this goes. And I think that, you know, bringing a Steve Belichick in to run the defense is just going to make this easier as well. Right. And then again, to your point, it's like not, there's going to be probably multiple players over the course of the season wearing it. Right. Cause I think, or at least in terms of, the, they're at least going to try a few different guys to see. They're going to do it during guys. spring, is what they said. I, once, once you get into the season, you're going to want to keep that one person out there on the field for the most part. And then if you need to make a, make a switch, that's, that's when you'll do it. But that'll be few and far between for the most part. Right. But exactly to your point, they want to see who else can kind of handle it. But I think kind of, it just seems natural that Carson will be the guy doing it. Yeah. Cause otherwise you're probably thinking Camp Abiculon and safety. It would be maybe, Al, maybe Alfonso. Like it's those, those three. three those, those, yeah. those would be the only three in my opinion. Cause you're not, cause you're not going to go outside and you're not going to have it be a D lineman where right. no, no offense to D lineman. It's like, look, you just got, you just got to figure out the front four. You guys figure that out. We're going to set everything up with the linebackers. And I think that's why the four, two, five works, right? I know Steve Belichick was asked and didn't confirm mm -hmm. it, but it's real. Like that's what the four, two, five does. You have the two linebackers to set everything up at the base and then play around with the back end. But sure. I think Carson's going to, I think Carson's going to handle that naturally. I mean, I think one thing that he told me back in February when I did talk with him one-on-one. -on -one, so again, there's a little bit of difference here. We basically <laughs> said the exact same thing after practice where he's like, look, I, I thought about, you know, I took, I took about a second and a half to look, but again, it's like, I'm, I'm a Washington kid. I'm, my dad went to Washington. I, I've been waiting for this moment for about four years now. So I'm not going anywhere, but it's, you know, what, what else can kind of come from that? Right. What, how much, how much, how quick, Oh, what he told me was, learning the relationship that he, Steve Belichick and Bill Belichick had towards like, Hey, what's the nuances? What's kind of the small little things. And I think having that relationship with Belichick already back in February, I think that's why kind of just there's a natural communication lead between Carson and the defensive staff. That's not to say that other players couldn't do it. Sure. But it's almost like Car Carson just tailor made for that. Right. Because he knows, knows the sport high football IQ without question. And I mean, imagine imagine a football conversation on the field with Steve Belichick and Carson Bruder. It's just like just, you, you can just watch that poetry in motion all day. Like, I think then we're going to try a couple of like, probably the other two that you mentioned, but I think Carson's going to be the one with it, which kind of gets me then to another question of who's your linebackers behind them? Because we've seen a little bit of rotation there. The one thing that I'm intrigued, and I know you'll, you, I know you can probably talk a little bit about this more in depth, but Tristan Dunn's role. He's going yeah. to have a role on this team. I have written him down at linebacker, at safety, at nickel, at – I basically just put done. The D-U-N-N. -N, just the done, <laughs> circled him, first team, second team, whatever wherever he is. I'm kind of just basically putting in that 11. He's in this region. He's in this region. He's basically just a right. back seven kind of guy, if you will. So it feels like – and it's something that Cameron Fabiculanen alluded to a little bit when we talked to him on Saturday as well – is he alluded to the Husky kind of still being a role in the defense where it seems like it might change a little, but it's probably going to stay the same at the same point where, you know, that's just it's just typical coach speak at this point. But 
when I look at that, that's where Tristan Dunn would be at his best, where as he continues to add weight, he's got length where he can come down and be just, I remember saying this on the sidelines where, you know, if he was a little bit more developed as a true freshman and in 2022, when Jed Fish in Arizona came up here to Seattle, I feel like we would have seen him in a lot of man coverage on Tanner McLaughlin. And I feel like that's a role we might see a lot from him this year, where he's going to be the second safety on the field instead of Mikhail Steen, where they're just going to ask him, all right, play man coverage against tight ends, where that was something they asked in a little bit of a different way too, where he'll fill a similar similar role that I think Patrick Chung did in New England, where it's a lot of run support. It's a lot of sometimes you're basically lining up as an extra linebacker, but you have the fluidity, the athleticism, the coverage skills to turn your back and go play safety, to come up and play man coverage or to make a stop in the run game. So there are a whole lot of different things that you can do with a guy like that. And it's just a matter of, okay, where is he going to fit best or in certain situations and just kind of feeling out that process and seeing what it looks like at the nickel position in particular, which I'm really curious about. And uh, you talked about Jordan Shaw a little bit. I think Devon Banks is going to start in the nickel personally, and then it'll be Jordan Shaw behind him this year. And then we'll just kind of see what happens there. But I wouldn't be surprised if both those guys come off the field in search certain situations and certain personnel groupings to get Tristan Dunn in there just to see what might be going on. So that's, that's kind of one thing that I'm curious about there, but Lars, we'd be remiss if we didn't spend some time talking about the offensive line here where there are certainly a whole lot of questions on the offensive line. We know there are going to be a couple of portal guys coming in. We don't know who yet, you know, you and I have alluded to the possibility of Parker Brailsford where We'll see if that happens. We know that there are a bunch of other guys out there. We'll see if any Arizona guys end up putting their name in the transfer portal after spring practice. And we just know that this is going to be a really crazy spring transfer portal period in general. And it starts in a week. It starts on April 15th. So, you know, things will probably start heating up around then. But where where are they going with this? I, I'm just, I'm really curious is, is the best way to say it. Well, I mean, I was going to say, didn't Brendan Carroll mention they want five or six more offensive linemen? Yeah. And Jed, Jed Fish said something similar, too. And, and so, we're, like, okay, if, if, let's, let's just throw out, let's just start throwing out the names now. Parker Brosford, Marcus Brown. That's only two. You've still got a majority of that line to work with. And so, what that tells me is they're going for multi year guys and one off guys. There's a combination, sure. right? But Parker's a, could be, again, anybody in Parker's situation, right? A sophomore that has years coming back versus a grad. Branson transfer, Hickman right? being another name that we've discussed, where he'd be a one year, a one year stopgap. Where, and center is an interesting position. I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's it's something that you and I have talked about a lot, where it's, all right, what's going to happen with Landon Hatchet? Where we know he's still working his way back from from a knee injury we've seen him walking around sporting the scar at spring practice where you know we're not going to make any assumptions but we know he had knee surgery we know he had a knee injury and that's what we'll say about that matter so if he redshirts this season that's not a bad thing where he gets to continue to rehab from his injury he was just really forced into playing time as a true freshman we know ryan grubb trusted him but we know how high his ceiling is and if he has that year to grow and develop like we know that was the plan for him coming into 2023 before all the injuries happened to Mateo Mele to guard Memelar that kind of forced him into the rotation that getting a Branson Hickman, getting a Parker Brailsford, getting a, another top interior lineman to come in and play center for a year and go off to the NFL would be a really, really big thing. Exactly. I mean, I think honestly, it's kind of like, and this is no slight to the previous coaching staff, but I think in a perfect world, they landed redshirts last year. He plays four yeah. or five or however the Giles Jackson treatment of, hey, once we get in the postseason play, it doesn't matter. But you get four plus whatever we make it to. Sure. Once that didn't happen, I think then everything kind of unraveled where it's like, okay, wait, now we're kind of just reacting. And where in a way that you don't want to have something like that happen this year where you have to burn a, burn a red, like Michael Watkins, right? Where you don't want to have to play him more than four games. Yeah, and I think that's kind of why they want to bring in some of these guys that are redshirt freshmen, redshirt sophomores elsewhere, who maybe have you know spot spark playing not spot, spark spot playing time. They haven't been true starters, but would add key depth pieces, right? There was a tackle sure. from Northwestern that transferred to Arizona prior to Jed Fish's departure. Names escape me off the top of my head, but don't be surprised if they go for a couple of guys like that, where it's like, hey, look, we need impact guys. We also need some guys behind them who are okay waiting until next year to play, right? Where Jurassic sure. Party's not going to wait, but wouldn't hurt if Pocky had to wait, or at least got you, to play a little bit, but had to wait. 
Right. And another name you, you referenced that same mold would be tackle Marcus Bryant from SMU. We know he's scheduled to be on an official visit. We had some people asking us we we believe it's scheduled for this Friday is when it's supposed to start. So that would be the, the you know, 12th, 13th, somewhere in that region where it looks like that's when it's, it's going to be starting. And that's a guy that I really would keep a close eye on. I, and obviously we talked about some guys at Arizona. I don't know about Jonas Savaena is the one name where if he entered the transfer portal, I would, that would blow my mind because he's just so insanely talented. I love watching that kid play Raymond Polito being another one where we know there was a lot of interest there. He put his name in the portal, took it out of the portal, I believe when uh, just in that, that early period. So there are a whole lot of things to watch over the, just the course of the offensive line tight end being another position where it's similar in terms of depth uh, and just, you need to make sure that there are extra players at that position. But Lars, with that being said, we're gonna have some fun because it's agenda time. So we wanted to make this very, very just broad where all the everydayers know we love our agendas here on this show. And after one week of spring practice, it's time for us to plant some flags. It's time to just say, all right, these are our guys. I don't care. We're going for it. So Lars, I'm just, I'm going to hand it off to you here to start. So one, again, that I've got, it's going to be a, a little lower on the totem pole, but I want to go back to it. Cause again, it's kind of re circles back together. All the first segment, honestly, one that we missed in the third segment is the receivers. I think Rasheed Williams is going to make a significant impact behind Denzel Boston. I think yeah. Denzel, obviously, again, I'm not going to, Denzel Boston's already his agenda. Denzel Washington, also known as Denzel Boston. If you don't understand that reference, go I, back to Roman Dune days. <laughs> that was good. Roman Dune's day last spring, uh, throw it off Michael Penix. But um, without question, Denzel is going to be the guy, right, uh, uh, behind, yeah. ahead of him. But the way Rashid has looked at the early part of his camp, I think he's got to make the two deeps. It's just a question of how much reps does he get, right? But he's going to sure. be in the two deeps. And I think – I know that's not a big kind of statement sort of thing. But, again, when you're looking at this offense and the multitude that Jed Fish can run with it, how, you need to have more than three, four, five receivers, right? Where Again, what if Jeremiah Hunter goes down, Denzel kicks over, and then Rashid's got to come up. Some, you got to have multiple guys coming in. And looking at that receiver group where Tisha Lyons already transferred to Utah – Keith Reynolds has looked good, but I think of the two, Keith is in a different mold. Keith probably goes behind Giles Jackson, whereas Rashid, I think, could be a guy where after after Jeremiah Hunter goes and after Giles Jackson goes this season, he, he could really have that two-year cooking period that Rome and Jalen yeah. and Jalen had where, hey, he's going to get some reps this season. He's probably going to get what? 300, 400, maybe 500 yards total. Again, sure. I, I get, I, I'm just saying with injuries and everything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But between 200 and 500 yards, a couple of touchdowns, some targets, but then that's going to lead into 25 where he should really cook. And I think I know agendas are for this year, but I'm going to plant that flag really. No, early agendas on are agendas. Gonna, agendas are whatever you want them to be. Because the agenda, well, because again, to be, I just want to paint a clear picture. Right? I'm, I'm in no way saying Rashid Williams is going to be 1A, 1B this year. But what he's going to be this season is an impactful guy that if injuries arise could become even more important. And then down the road, this season will lay that foundation for him. And he's such a good kid, man. So give me that, that, that's the first one I wanted to talk about. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to an old reliable well here where I'm trying to go with outside of projected starters right now. So I, I gave myself a little bit of a caveat. I know I just said I wanted to be broad, but I, I, I try to challenge myself a little bit with some of these. And it's not going to be surprising to anybody who listens to the show. Any of the Everdares will know that I love talking about Lance Holdsclaw, where Lance is an awesome kid. Shout out to Dorchester, Massachusetts. But I just, I've really been impressed with the strides that he's made. We saw it last fall. We've seen it again this spring. We saw him get some reps with the ones. I don't think that I'd project him to start on the other side right now, where, you know, I, I would probably put Maurice Himes in that role outside of, or opposite Zach Durfee, where, Maurice has the 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 best body type to kind of turn into a true edge setting. I can get off the passer every now and again, just defender. We're kind of in the same mold of what Jeremiah Martin was in 2022. And I think that Lance behind him is the perfect rotational piece. You and I spent some time on Friday talking about, uh, Russell, or on Saturday after practice, talking about Russell Davis, Isaiah Ward, and how good those guys can be, their body type, just kind of what they might be able to add. And I think Lance can be a little bit more of a souped up version of them with 
more playing time this year where we saw his him get a sack in the apple cup we saw the speed we saw the burst we saw everything he's able to do off the edge and if he just gets more playing time with more consistency i think that he really could turn into a, a at just at, at floor a very solid rotational edge rusher where as he continues to add weight and add more strength that he could end up probably like you said by 2025 being a starter being a huge piece of the rotation but and i think we're going to see that that first step towards that this year no, no, I agree completely. And I think it's kind of one of those where the edge position is a little unique in that where there's no true defined starter. There's there's no right. Braylon Trice on this team right now. But there's so many guys. I mean, I think that first week we've seen Isaiah Ward, remember to your point, Maurice Himes, Zach Durfee, Lance Holtzko, all do a number of different things. I mean, Isaiah Ward being the one, right? Yeah. Move, he's Seven, just moving all over the place. Your, your fifth option in nickel is wild to me. But that's beside <laughs> the point. But – um. But the other, to your point, I know I'm going to now I'm going to cheat a little bit here, but I'm going to keep the same relative position Please. group here. Javon Parker. That yeah, that's see, that's, has, that's where I I wanted to, but go for it. Yeah, take it. Because I'll give you a link. Because again, Javon Parker, where again he's not a starter, returning starter, right? He's not. We had this discussion where it's like, okay, who are the quote unquote returning starters? Because there's like two or three: Cam Fab, Alfonso. And then you got a few other guys who have made starts but not actually been full season starters. Javon Parker, barring some unforeseen problem, is going to be a I'm going to say second team off uh, defensive lineman in the Big Ten. Like okay. the, the way the, the way that he's going right now, he's got the perfect size to do it. We know what he can do as a pass rusher, but I think he's getting better in the run, in the run fits where it wasn't bad to begin with. But again, also it depends. He's on just who taking he's playing that next, next step. Right, exactly. It depends on who he's been playing to playing next to you over the course of his time at Washington, where you know, if he's playing next, I'm not gonna throw anybody under the bus here, but if he's playing next to somebody else who maybe isn't as strong on the run, he kind of takes the brunt of that. But when you look when you watch the first three practices in spring ball, they've done some third and short, fourth and shorts, and they've got them, but we're talking like either by the thinnest of margins or they don't get it on third and then have to push it on fourth. And so Javon's taking that next step to me. My thing is again with my guy Philip Bleedy. If they can pair somebody with him and just kind of add one more piece sure. on the inside, just a wrecker, same same sort of thing, where it's like, hey, J-Rod can do his thing, and then we're going to put somebody next to him as a one-off, as a mercenary. That's why you get the best out of both of them. Because, again, when you're going to the Big Ten, you can't just have a Javon Parker and an Armand Parker and a Sebastian Valdez and, and even a Russell Davis, if you want to call it that, right? I mean, Russell's more outside, but let's just say you kick him around, avoid to new if you whatever. All those guys are nice. But you need one more piece, right? There's just a, that one little missing piece. And so I think if they could add that, that's my, that's my side quest agenda is Philip Bleedy because if Washington can pull him off, like that, and again, by no means are they because he's got at least three more. Got some planned. other big visits, yeah. So again, and one of them is this week. So I'm not, I'm in no way, shape, or form saying pencil him in as your guy. But if that pull can happen and you put him next to a improved Javon Parker, it, Armand comes behind him. Armand comes plays next to him. On a, when Javon comes out, or they go, they, there's so many more creative ways that Steve Belichick and Jason Kavusi can get with that defensive front. If you add one more big time body with a pass rush talent like Philip Lee has to that unit, right? I, I I like everything you said there. I I I was going in a different direction with my next one. I'm flipping back over to the offensive side here. Give me Adam Muhammad. I've been really, really impressed with Adam Muhammad so far where I like his build. I like his physicality. I like his speed. And I know we talked about it the other day, but I, I just really wanted to circle back to around to all these points where I've been super impressed with everything we've seen from him. And it's a really great pull by Jet Fish and his staff while they were down in Arizona, follows all of them up here to Washington. And, you know, we've seen him make some nice plays as a pass catcher, we've seen him make a couple of nice moves, be really shifty in the run game. And, we're not going to see a lot of time from him this year. He at, at best fills a Tybo Rogers role from 2023, but I'm just really intrigued and just, I, I, I feel really good about what we've seen from him because of just all the measurables and everything we've seen physically. And as he continues to learn the scheme and just get comfortable at the college level, I think he's somebody where, you know, let's say both Jonah Coleman and Cam Davis are out after this year. Where, you know, even if he's a redshirt freshman next year, I'd feel comfortable with throwing him into the starting rotation. 
No doubt. And I mean, I think it, it's kind of funny as you're watching Adam Muhammad run, it's almost like, yeah, he can, he's kind of similar to Tybo, but it's almost like he's a little more put together. And I mean that on the field, not off the field. I mean, just saying like in general, just his game kind of looks more complete coming in. Again, still has got a ways to go. Still needs to get bigger. I'm glad you mentioned Cam Davis, though, because, again, I think to your point about that, Adam Muhammad is that good kind of progression guy. Well, he'll probably get three, four games. I don't know if he'll get more than four just because of that room. There's a lot of bodies in there, even if somebody transfers out. But similar to yours, Daniel and Gata and Cam Davis both look like they're going to have a role in this offense where yeah. I don't know what happened last season with Daniel and Gata or if he upset Lee Marks or something, but I know he did. I'm just, I'm joking. I'm half joking because he was basically just, he should have gotten more playing time. Yeah. As, especially with the way the running back room fell apart last season, just injury wise and all that. I mean, again, no, that's not that I say fell fall apart. No disrespect to Dylan Johnson. Dylan Johnson carried that thing. But when Cam Davis went out with the lower body injury, I was basically waiting for Daniel and Gata and it never came. Now Scotty Graham, and I think that's the other thing to note here about the running backs. I have no problem with the running back room. That'll be fine. I, whoever starts, I mean, Jonah Cole yeah. is obviously going to start. But whoever plays in that room, I have no doubt they will get great coaching. Great, they, they, The running back room will be fine. I, I am not worried about that in size. <laughs> but I am curious to see how do Cam Davis and Daniel Gata mix into that room because Adam Muhammad's going to get some time. I don't necessarily know if it's going to be a ton this season barring injury. But I do also want to note that it is important that Cam Davis has looked pretty good coming back from that injury. So I think yeah. you know, again, by no means full go in terms of, you know, when we get to fall camp, we'll see how much he really has improved. But having that trio plus the future is a key balance there for me. Absolutely. Lars, as always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the everydayers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your consistent support as you, you're listening to this. We're getting ready to head out to another spring practice. So please make sure you keep it right here on Lockdown Huskies as we're going to review each and every single practice. And we've got so much fun stuff planned for you over the rest of the off season. And to just the, the best way to make sure you're in tune with everything we're doing, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, we're there, we're everywhere, we're updating the channel with new content every single day so please make sure hit that like button hit that subscribe button and click that little bell so you never miss when we post a new video please leave us a comment down below if you have any questions comments concerns anything like that if you're audio only please leave us a five-star review as it all really does help the show out a lot thank you so much for tuning in and we will talk to you on wednesday <laughs>